Good morning. Good morning. I'm Chad Stebbins from the Institute of International Studies, and it's my pleasure to introduce the esteemed Dr. Jim Jackson, Professor Emeritus of Biology. In my opinion, one of the finest professors Missouri Southern has ever had the pleasure of having on, on staff. I think he would. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think anyone would, would argue with me across the campus, and a number of your faculty colleagues are here this morning to support you. So it was 40 years ago this fall that a younger Dr. Jackson came to Missouri Southern uh, from <laughs> Colorado uh, by way of Rutgers University, and we've, of course, been fortunate to have him ever since. He's been retired two years now, so you are getting a special treat this morning uh, to hear him. His presentation has a very catchy title, The Isles of the British Isles. So let's hear what Dr. Jackson has to say. <laughs> Thank you. And actually, can you hear me? Yes, okay, there's a couple of things I'm gonna talk about. The first part of this is I want to, to talk to you about how I think you should be tourists. And um, so about the first 25 minutes, I'm gonna discuss deep tourism, deep tourism every, as opposed to shallow tourism. And what that means is that my wife and I traveled around Europe multiple decades ago and visited 14 different countries, but we lit upon England and we found out that England was the most fascinating. And we decided to continue to go back to England and to discover new places, not to go back to the same place over and over, but to go to new places until we ran out of new interesting places to see. And we've been there maybe 20 times, and we still, there's just, it seems like there's more fascinating places about this country uh, to see. Uh, some of you may know, anybody know what that uh, building, or what that place is? Have you seen that before? Yes, young lady, what is that? Yeah, this is where Downton Abbey was filmed. We were able to go there. And this is one of those really famous looking uh, places in England that most people, except you all, uh, <laughs> not kidding, most people know. Uh, but also, not 20 miles from there is Deerham Park. And this also is equally beautiful and historically significant and not very well known. Uh, there will be tourists going there and that sort of thing, but the benefit of this deep tourism is the ability to be able to see those obscure little places and see things that normal tourism wouldn't. And probably the best way to do this, by the way, is to uh, how you travel. And my suggestion, when you all decide to travel, uh, maybe the first time, but from then on out, don't go with tours. Just grab yourself a, t a ticket, go to some airport, hire a car, jump in that car, especially in England, because it's great fun, because you jump in on, you have the steering wheel on the right side, and <laughs> by God, that's fun, you know? You jump in there, and I do, and Brenda said I should tell you all that the first time I was in England driving on, that, on the other side of the road, I did crash, uh, but it wasn't a bad crash. You get over that, and then from then on out, it's just really great, great fun. And imagine this, the, the steering wheel is on the right side, the gas pedal is right next to the door. You shift with your left hand. And by the way, if you get a stick shift car, it's about a third the price, because they know Americans are too uh, afraid to do a stick shift. But you can learn it in about 20 minutes and it's, it's great fun, so go ahead and, and do that. Practice right now, everybody put your left hand out and shift from first to second. Perfect, <laughs> see how easy it is? And also, another thing that I would suggest is that rather than staying in uh, hotels that are filled with other tourists and stuff, there's a thing called holiday flats. And if you stay in hotels, you're just around with other tourists. If you go bed and breakfast, you really get to know the English people well, but they are so bent on giving you a plate of food that's the size of a Buick that you can be just <laughs> bloated. No kidding, a breakfast, a breakfast there consists of, of uh, baked beans and, and uh, many eggs and uh, um, uh, things like black pudding. Do any of you know what black pudding is made from? Blood, Blood absolutely, yes. 
How many of you would be, say, opposed to eating something made from the blood of a cow? Opposed. Is anybody here looking forward to it? <laughs> All right, I knew there was, yeah. Oh, he's that dark man, he really is. <laughs> but anyway, um, I would suggest then getting a holiday uh, flat or a holiday cottage. Actually, this is a place we rented in Anglesey. Uh, they couldn't rent it that week. It rents from Saturday to Saturday. They didn't have anybody to take it. So we got the whole place. It's a huge house out in the country because what a, time, a lot of times a family will, an agricultural family will get rich. Well, not rich. They will be financially stable enough to take, build a new house for the family. And instead of tearing down the old 17th or, or 16th century house, they'll just let tourists come along and, and uh, hire that out in the summertime. And, and this is where we stayed. And I think the most positive aspect of this house is it came equipped with a cat. <laughs> yes, I knew you'd like that. And this, we drove in, and this cat came running down the driveway saying, ah, oh, tourists, you know, because they knew we would eat, eat well and get a lot of attention. Uh, also, there's some interesting things you can try out that you normally wouldn't. Static caravans. And a static caravan is a trailer house that doesn't go anyplace, and you just rent it from week to week. And that's great fun. I mean, <laughs> um, I mean, there was a whiff of trailer trash about me at the time, but that's all right. <laughs> There's the social stratification I wanted to mention, yes. <clears throat> and, uh, but really, it was wonderful. It was a very comfortable place. Yeah, that's right. And then also, one time, we even hired a static tent. We stayed in a tent. This is Brenda sitting in that static tent in the living room. She's right next to the bedroom of this. They, they weren't bad tents. This wasn't a pump tent. Some of the cottages were wonderful. Uh, we were, this is in Northern Ireland. And yes, Northern Ireland is part of, of Great Britain. And um, this was a, a little bitty cottage on a grand estate. This used to be the gamekeeper's cottage. But they didn't have a gamekeeper, and so they let and uh, just a real romantic, beautiful place to, uh, to be. Um, also, <clears throat> you can uh, have, this is a holiday flat. This was a house in Buxton, and it had four apartments that were just designed for people to stay in on a weekly basis. We had the, the second floor up there, and that's the bay window that we're sitting in. It was a very nice, nice place to stay. Also, uh, I would really, you know, when you, the first time you go visit England, you'll have to do the obvious things, Stonehenge and the British Museum and the Tower of London and all that sort of stuff. But the next time, you can be free to just come along and do whatever happens to be down the road. And factory tours are amazing. Um, how many, have any of you been, ever been on any factory tour? Good. All right. There we go. Because they are really fun. This is the Wedgwood factory, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and... How amazing to go here to where they probably make the best porcelain, I think, in the world, and the most beautifully aesthetically designed, and be able to see people who uh, actually make this right there in front of you. And, they've been, and this factory has been in the same place for three or 400 years, c continuing that tradition. Also, what do you suppose they make at this factory? Whiskey, whiskey. yeah, <laughs> that's right. And somebody here indicated that I was going to have whiskey for everybody, but I don't have enough, so I'm sorry. And somebody mentioned I would be committing a felony of sorts and sometimes. So. But actually, no, this is in, uh, in Scotland. And uh, as you realize, if it's whiskey and it's made in Scotland, it is scotch. And it is a tradition in these places that are older than Jack Daniels, three, 400 years old. They've been making this brilliant, wonderful, expression of their culture um, and uh, and as all factory tours you get a, a moment to sample the wares at the end of the tour which is actually a pleasant experience also another thing that uh, happens in England <coughs> is uh, sometimes a factory was a factory in the 19th century time of uh, uh, the Industrial Revolution and they'll make it a, a museum and you can see what this was was a silk mill <coughs> And as you can see, it's built on a waterway so that water wheels would run the machinery of the silk mill. They would take silk from China, and they would dye it, and then they would turn it into silk fabrics. And it still functions in a demonstration sort of way. And you can see the, the silk as it's being prepared and, and woven, and, and uh, it is a fascinating process to see, a, a glimpse into the, the social 
aspects of the Industrial Revolution and also a beautiful fine art. Um, also, I think one of the most important things about deep tourism is you'll be able to see, um, meet people. Um, in fact, right here, what we see is a, a dear friend of ours that came, became a dear friend because we were, we were touring this place uh, extensively. On the left-hand side, you see the man with the little boy in hand? The man's name is Jimmy Dice, and he was a shepherd. And how fun it was. I, we came from an agricultural background to meet somebody who is a, a shepherd. This sounds almost biblical, as a matter of fact. But um, he had 300 sheep, female sheep called ewes, and he took care of these on a grand estate. And we got to know him because he lived in that uh, village that we were associated with and learned a little bit about agriculture uh, in a different place as well. And that little boy in tow is also the same person that is, seems to have an overly friendly relationship with a Guernsey in the right-hand side. <laughs> uh, a wonderful man named, uh, young man named Jamie Dice. And Jamie now followed in his father's footsteps. We saw him through his whole development in agricultural passion. And he's the manager of an organic dairy in Winchcombe. And he has about 150 head of, uh, uh, anybody know what kind of cow that is by the way it looks? extra credit for you, all of you people, if anybody knows. Did somebody say Guernsey? Oh, what, oh. Well, <laughs> I did give it away, yeah. You get extra credit, young man. So, um, but anyway, um, we were able to follow him from being a little bitty boy and up to his whole life. Also, we were able to kind of learn about the educational system. This young man was actually here. Uh, I went over there and did some research on grassland restoration. <clears throat> and at the park I was working at, this fellow happened to be a, one of the park managers there. His name is Simon Waddy. And I watched and assisted, and we had an exchange of researchers between there and here during this period of time. And he then went to a, a university in Oxford in um, uh, ecological management, and now he works for uh, British Rail. And that is him in the right. You see, the bald guy is obviously me. Next to him is, uh, is Simon Wadi, and he is an environmental manager for British Rail. And when they put in new rails or repair them, he's the one that makes sure they don't do any damage as far as the uh, uh, putting in the rails are concerned. We also, uh, going there and spending a good amount of time uh, is an important important way, a wonderful way to get to know the ecclesiastical environment. This is, uh, we decided last uh, December to spend a month in, uh, in Wales in uh, St. David's Cathedral and just experience all of their liturgical celebrations of Christmas. And the, the um, uh, 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 clerical staff there, uh, the clergy, were just so welcoming and nice. Um, so, in fact, this guy is a, a dean of the college. Was he a dean? A, a what? Canon, yeah, a canon of the uh, uh, cathedral. And um, he was just very welcoming, as you can see here. Invited us up. Where, where we are is in the bell tower. And he invited us to come up into the bell tower and watch them ring the bells at New Year's Eve and ring in New Year's Eve. In fact, do you see the, can you see the clock up there? Yeah, it's just right after. This is right after the bells had rung. So, uh, and then also deep tourism will reveal British history in Neolithic, Bronze Age, and Roman sites, as well as the cathedrals. Um, this is obviously where, where am I standing? In front, yeah. But I really think that the most interesting of these, the most interesting Neolithic sites may only be a point on the map. Stonehenge, like that previous slide, has a beautiful interpretive center where they tell you as much as they possibly can about these enigmatic people who live there and we don't know. We know what they built because it was all out of stone. We don't know who they were exactly. We don't know what language. We don't know what religion they had. Uh, but there is, it. we also know by DNA testing that if you're Northern European, it's us. That's, that's our ancestors are there. And it always brings a chill to my and my wife's spine to come up and, and you put your hand on some stone circle that is way out there in, in the middle of nowhere. And you know that somebody in the Neolithic time using stone tools and ropes and, and timber were able to make things like this or Stonehenge. And uh, 
I don't know, we don't know what it was, but it seems like there's sort of a mystical mystery that surrounds all of those. There's never a time, and there's hundreds of stone circles. Yeah. Not all of them are burial grounds. Some of them might be just ceremonial. It's, we really just, or astro, yeah, in fact, what a fitting day that I be here. You realize today, right now, is the equinox. And this is incredibly important to the Neolithic people. And these monuments were built up to align with the sun. Um, <laughs> holy mackerel. Right, that, that point means that was the equinox. <laughs> it is now fall. <laughs> uh, this, actually, this was um, on a little island in Northern Ireland, to give you an idea of this religious... Uh, and this tradition. Northern Ireland, by the way, is part of Great Britain, so that's why we can include that. This is a little bit later. It's a pre-Christian Celtic deity that we ran across. It has a face on both sides. It kind of feels like a Janus stone. And it um, is, uh, it's still venerated, which is sort of interesting. It actually was in a graveyard. Um, and you come up there and it's thought to be three or 4,000 years old. People will still put coins on top of it uh, with an offering of sort or something like that, you know. So uh, do you suppose I put a coin on top? Yeah, I did. You know, you want to cover all your bases. <laughs> so <clears throat> also, uh, again, it's a continuing history of who we are. Brenda and I found a, um, a copper mine. This copper mine, 4,000 years ago, oh, uh, produced tons and tons of copper for Bronze Age people who used mostly axe head or, uh, you know, stone tools, uh, antlers and that sort of thing to mine and smelt copper. And it was traded throughout the world. And uh, these, uh, the, we went down in the tunnels and I mean, it's like going into a, uh, like going into Chan Stebbins' office, you know, just <laughs> like, like that. <laughs> so uh, it's amazing to see. Probably deep British tourism has shown us that the post-Roman history best in its, oh, it's amazing to see the castles and the cathedrals. You can go into these castles and feel, uh, in the castles, you built for defense first, but then uh, sort of a romantic feeling about them. You can see the history from things like the, um, the Civil Wars to the Reformation or something like that in the castles, and the same with the cathedrals. The castle on the left is probably the most famous in Scotland. Anybody know where that is? Yeah? Oh, who said Edinburgh? Oh, well done, yes. Very good, Edinburgh. And then this is the most iconic cathedral in, in uh, London. It was, uh, I believe, designed by Sir Christopher Wren after the Great Fire. And uh, that is because of its because of its round ball dome. I I associate with its cathedral a little bit. This is obviously St. Paul's. Yeah, very good. <clears throat> and but I think the most intriguing castles aren't the best known. This is Bodium Castle. It was f uh, featured uh, prominently in again the Civil War period of of England. And then also take a look at that. Isn't that the iconic looking castle with the moat and the castellated walls and, and a feeling of uh, uh, something you'd see in Prince Valiant <laughs> in the comic books or something like that. It just had a real wonderful feeling. And then also the cathedrals. You should visit every cathedral in England because every one of them is different, but every one of them reflects our history. This is Leicester Cathedral. And what's in interesting about that is a couple of years ago, um, well, I'll make a short story long. <laughs> uh, uh, nobody knew where Pri uh, Richard III was buried. They had no idea. And then somebody did some historical survey and said, you know, he might be buried out underneath the shopping center uh, parking lot. And they, no, they said. And they dug down, and there he was. And it was a great sort of insight into uh, Richard. Th he wasn't as crippled as they thought. And, you know, there's some real, there was a, he got some bad press, really bad press, from a guy named Shakespeare. And I think that did him harmful for his whole life, as a matter of fact. He was, a, he was not a bad guy, was he? You, you don't think so, do you? You think he was a bastard. Well, he did have severe well not severe. Yeah, 
Well, okay, so he was a little bent over. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, we'll argue about this later. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> they decided a king of England should have a burial in a cathedral, and there he is. Um, we really have a lot in common. This is a quote from Oscar Wilde. We really have a, uh, everything in common with America nowadays, except, of course, language. Pavement refers to the sidewalk and not the street. We had a student go over there and do some student teaching with a bunch of little kids. And they were walking down. Half of them were on the road. Half of them were on the sidewalk. And she said, get off the pavement. And, and, and they, all, they all jumped off of the sidewalk and got into the street, you know. And nine of them were killed. No, actually, no. no. <laughs> None of them were. But, uh, and also we had a student in... in um, the UK, the word rubber means an eraser. And uh, we had a student run into the bookstore down in there, up to the little Tootsie Pop that was running the, the, the cash register and said, I need a rubber really fast, you know. And uh, the vernacular in the United States for a rubber is, uh, do you all know that means a condom? Yeah, okay. <laughs> he, he would not go back to that bookstore again. He was embarrassed about that. A boot and a bonnet are part of a car. <clears throat> the boot is the trunk and the bonnet is the hood. Yeah, you bet. A bog, if a man says, I'm going out to the bog, where is he going? Yeah. Bathroom, you bet, yeah. <laughs> Apparently they used to just do their stuff in the bog that was out in the back. Well done. First floor, it trips you up every time because you think if you're walking into a building on the, on, from the ground, that's the first floor. <laughs> That's not, that's the ground floor. And we kept getting, <laughs> uh, like if we were gonna get a holiday flat, they said, yeah, it's up on the second floor. I thought, well, that's not a problem, you know, one flight up, and you go in there and you think, oh, crud, <laughs> there's our room. And it was up three long, you know, one and then two, and you'd have to be up on that, uh, that second floor. So a flat is an apartment. If, you, uh, if you're going snipe hunting, and they want you to take your mobile and your torch, they actually mean your mobile is your cell phone. Your torch is what? Flashlight, yeah. Uh, a hob is a, a, um, <coughs> a uh, stove. Wellingtons are the rubber boots that you wear. Um, gammon, I, I kept going to these pubs and ordering, uh, seeing gammon steak. And uh, I wonder what the, finally I thought, well, you know, I've never even seen one of these gammons running around in the, uh, <laughs> And uh, it's ham. It's just this wonderful big ham. It's another name for ham. Um, coriander is cilantro. Uh, aubergine. Anybody know what an aubergine is? Yes, an eggplant. Yeah. Uh, you know, you buy an English cookbook, and it's like a, in a different language sometimes. And then, as we mentioned before, black pudding is certainly made out of blood. Also, the best thing about England, I think, is the art. The art in the British Museum and the Tate Gallery, you can walk in there and see a painting in those beautiful museums that will, you'll remember for the rest of your life, I guarantee. However, if you just look any place, there's wonderful art. We were standing by Piccadilly Circus, by the station, and this guy drove up in this car, and for some reason, and I think it's art. <laughs> and you know, I thought, Maybe he's an x-ray guy, I don't know. There was nothing on there. But uh, it sure was a fascinating, I used this in my radiation biology class as the opening lecture for years. Um, street art is an unexpected delight in Great Britain. Uh, on the right you see an elephant painted like a bird. Uh, a deep symbolic, uh, yeah, all right, we have no idea what it means. On the left, Brenda and I saw this guy, this is performance art. And he had all of the spectators wrap him in saran wrap. And I don't want to go into details, but it, it didn't end well, no. <laughs> garden art is wonderful. The best gardens in the world are in England. I guarantee it. They are just gorgeous because of the climate and the people's attitude and the plants that they have brought in from everywhere. But there's great, gar uh, great art there as well. Uh, an inexplicable life-size statue of a man pulling himself. I think what he's trying to do is to get out of gardening, and he knows he never will. <laughs> and uh, whimsical art as well. Uh, in Hillier Gardens, which is in southern England, the wonderful, beautiful gardens, there's just really interesting art. Whimsical chickens on, on the, your left. Uh, 
dragonfly. What was really neat, you see that up on the upper uh, right-hand side, a guy took little fragments of aluminum, suspended them in a little frame, they reflected over the water, and then when a wave would come through the pond, it looked like a little school of fish. It was just a fascinating piece of work. Pub art is wonderful as well. One of our favorite pubs in Gloucestershire is called, obviously it is called, the Green Dragon. Um, and um, this pub art came from times when people didn't rely on words to identify where they were going. It reflects some of the interesting history of the area as well. A free house is owned by the person who uh, owns the pub, and he can serve any beer he wants. This commemorates the time in England, this wool pack, when wool was king. And England ruled the world with its woolen mills and made the best wool around. And they would shear the sheep, pack it in these horses, and then send it off to, uh, to be made in broadloom carpets and jackets and, and everything like that. The, the place on the right really reflects a kind of a cruel period in England. There was a period of time if they would capture a bear, they would chain it, shut its mouth up, put it in a pit, and then turn the dogs on it. And it was a spectator sport to watch the dogs rip the bear to, uh, to shreds. The pub is still in the place where that occurred, and it's still called the Black Bear. But um, I don't think, they, I know they don't do that sort of thing. The English are quite good to their animals. Uh, church art is amazing. This is a picture of uh, a medieval uh, imp from a Compton, Compton Abdale church. All of their churches used to be um, really well decorated with uh, different images. And this is a, a little uh, imp that was on the wall. I have no idea why it was there, but probably uh, apocalyptic sort of uh, reference or something like that. Uh, and then... Uh, I, Really, England has the best graffiti in the world. And graffiti really is art, I think. Um, there's some bad graffiti around, but uh, this, there was some uh, two um, uh, fiber boards set up to just protect a, uh, a um, construction site. And people had put uh, some kind of nice looking cats on. And these were big sort of things. They spent a long time doing that. Um, this is, uh, I took this picture in Brighton. Here's a monkey taking a selfie of, or a picture of me taking the picture of the, mo <laughs> the uh, monkey or something like that. But, um, and also take a look at, now look at that, you can see that's right down on street level. You see the cigarette butts and stuff down like that? But it's a beautiful cat. It's in the, the sort of continuum of the best graffiti artist in the world. If you ever get a chance, there is a graffiti artist who is known worldwide and he sells his work for a lot of money. Anybody know what it is? Uh, yes, Banksy, well done, extra credit for the young man. You get a shot of whiskey when this is over. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but this is sort of, of his style. By the way, do you, can you see the guy's initials who made this? Yeah, isn't that cool? He also did another one. This one was just down the street from it. This depicts uh, some small, innocent British children exchanging pounds for drugs, I believe, is what the... the <laughs> oh, theater tickets. I'm sure that's what it is. <laughs> yes. Also, art in the landscape is, is frequent and surprising and beautiful. This was a, a statue of a man we saw on the top of a mountain along a path in, in Guernsey. Uh, village churches can reflect a thousand years or more of political, religious, and cultural history. I just recommend that you go see them because you can see most of the positive, most of the positive and negative aspects of, of the history of England in these churches. It is just really amazing. This is uh, Compton Abdale where that little imp was from, and this was at Durham. But um, now is the second half of this. How am I doing for time? About right? Okay. And this, I'm going to talk about the mystical, mythical isles of the British Isles. And briefly, I'm going to mention uh, about five of these. Uh, in fact, um, we'll start with, uh, we've been to Shetlands, but I'm going to start with the Orkneys. Because um, what's neat about all of these islands, and I want you to go visit them, is that they are culturally and historically, and it feels like time-wise, set back from England. It's like time stops there a little bit, um, both in what is preserved historically and what goes on there. 
there's a place called Scarbray, <clears throat> and this village was occupied of between 3,200 and 2,200 BC for about 600 years. It was on the coast, and then it was covered by sand dunes, and covered until the 19th century, and then a big storm came through and uh, caused the sand to be removed, and it was like you just took um, you know, a village and preserved it for us to look at. And we know a lot about these people, or they do, uh, by looking at it. We, we saw where they slept, where they stored their food, how they built their walls. We don't know who they were. We don't know what they said. We don't know what they were. All right. <laughs> I'll be right there. Um, but it does give you a real interesting insight to the area. And also, again, standing stones. There are these sort of mysterious stone circles up there as well. These, I wanted to put a picture of those in because we really found these to be the most aesthetically appealing. Uh, take a look at that. Um, uh, they are called the Stones of Stennis. Uh, also, Orkney's 19th century black houses. These were occupied up until the middle of last century. Um, and take a look. This, for, this is not different from what it looked like 6,000 years ago. Thatched roofs, the stonework in there is all pretty much the same. Um, they even have a fire in the middle of the room there, um, not on a chimney, but it, the smoke just comes out the top. And they don't burn wood up in these areas. Do anybody know what they happen to use for fuel because there's no wood around? Yes. What's that? Yes, what she said is peat moss. Isn't that what you said? Yeah. <laughs> Close up. Yeah, uh, what they do is they go out and cut the, the sphagnum moss that is growing and compacted and dry it. And, uh, and that's why they're called black houses, because it is very smoky in there. And just a little bit of an aside, some of the breweries actually cure their barley with peat fires, and it makes a lovely whiskey. But um, I won't go into that in any great detail. But um, also, Orkney's pubs preserve artistic traditions. The music that you heard when you came in here was created by a couple of sisters named the Wrigley Sisters. And it is a beautiful connection to their, their history. It is just really wonderful. And the people, the, the musicians say, you can tell what island the music's from just by listening to it. And uh, I'm not that sophisticated, but I do enjoy that sort of music. There are some interesting islands off of the coast of Scotland, and there are the Outer Hebrides and the Inner Hebrides. And if you want to act cool to somebody, say, where you spend the summer? Oh, I'm going to the Outer Hebrides. There's just, <laughs> it sounds pretty neat. But uh, there's some interesting uh, islands there, um, Harris and Lewis. There's a wonderful woolen mill there and they make a tweed called a Harris tweed and if you have a Harris tweed jacket it is a really nice piece of work and Lewis is an amazing piece of work St. Kilda 15 of these islands are inhabited and take a look just imagine how isolated you might feel on an island that's about 30 miles by 10 miles 70 miles off the coast of Scotland mostly you're involved in fishing and that sort of thing it's a, a world into itself um, on the Outer Hebrides, this is in Lewis in Scotland, these are called brochs, and they were Iron Age, you know, maybe 2,000, 2,500 years ago. And it's thought that this is the structural predecessor of castles. You see the outer wall and the inner wall and where they might have kept the uh, uh, cattle and that sort of thing. Also, and I, I, you can tell I'm a sucker for these stone circles just because they have such a mystical feeling about them. These are the Kalanesh stone circles on the west coast of Lewis. The Inner Hebrides, these include things like Jura and uh, Isle, uh, Skye, Mull, Rosse. And the 36 are those are uh, uh, occupied. Let me go back to one. I want to show you one. Let's see. Never mind. <laughs> um, well, I'll show you here in another slide. Anyway, 36 of these are identified. Probably the most interesting, oh, they're all interesting. The most recent one that we visited was called the Isle of Mull. And um, it is uh, right there. And also take a look right there is a little island called Ione. I'll talk about that in just a second as well. Um, but uh, on the island of Mull, um, 
this is the main town there, and it is pretty much, you, if you're going to go there, you go by boat. Uh, uh, if you take the ferry there, you have to drive in, and it's about 30 miles, and they, they only have one road, and it's one lane. If somebody's coming towards you, you know, somebody has to get over. And it was a long haul <laughs> getting up in there. We arrived, and there was very little accommodation, so we splurged a little bit and stayed in that uh, hotel right up here. And see this floor up there? They let us have that one. And it was cheaper than the rest. Do you want to know why? There was no elevator. <laughs> and the stairs were narrow. And I had too much luggage. And oh, God. And by the way, see this? A test for you. Is that the fourth floor or the third floor? Third floor, well done, yes, that's right, because this is England. <laughs> the view was wonderful, and the food was amazing. You know, scallops would be plucked out of the ocean, and you would eat them 20 minutes later or something. So, um, uh, and that's Duart Castle, another one of those classic uh, Scottish castles that reflects the historical scene of those areas. Also, another amazing thing that I want to tell you about is the Isle of Iona in 5.30, St. Columba came here and established a monastery and a religious community. And he is still, no, he is. <laughs> there is a continuing site of religious worship and a monastery there to this day. And you can go there and have retreats, and you can go there and, and uh, there are theological conferences. If you, if you all um, go to church and you open up your hymnals, and you look down, I'll bet you to this day, one and ten, in the little tiny print down on the bottom, it'll say Iona. And, and the words were uh, of biblical origin and put, put there by, uh, by these monks. It is just an amazing, wonderful place to look at. This is uh, the current monastery that is there. And there's a lot of uh, uh, also, uh, archaeological stuff there. But it's just inspiring to see. You know, this sounds sort of hooky, but if you're in a place that has housed people's prayers for 1,500 years on a daily basis. There's some sort of resonance of, of the uh, wonderful spiritual aspect of that, I think. Um, another one is the mystical, mythical Isles of Anglesey. And they are actually part of this little part of, of Great Britain right there that's actually represented by this dragon here. What, what part of Britain is represented by that dragon? Anybody know? Wales. Wales. Oh, well done. Yes, very good. Extra credit. <laughs> Do you suppose I prepped these guys beforehand? Nah. <clears throat> anyway, if you'll take a look at this, here is uh, a little island called Anglesey. And there it is in red, and here it is a little bit uh, bigger. And again, all of these British Isles are wonderful to visit. I sound like a, uh, uh, working for the tourist agency. But they are beautiful. And what's the most beautiful aspect of it is these dramatic shorelines. You see a lighthouse here that has kept ships safe for hundreds, or th uh, hundreds of years. And you see a rocky coast that is just unbelievably uh, treacherous to take boats in and out. And you see houses where fishermen lived and went out in tiny little boats with nets and, and, and risked their lives every day to catch fish. In fact, in the different little coves, they would knit different stitches into the sweaters they wore in case somebody was overboard and washed up shore, they could look at the nature of the knit on the sweater and know what village he came from. So it was a hard place to live. This is a, a, now a museum that Brenda is standing in front of, but it sort of shows how the fishermen lived in those islands. And there's some really sort of uh, mystical and mythical aspects of it. The mythical, this is St. Winifred's Well, first mentioned in 1093. It's located near Holywell. And uh, what I want you to see is, you all see a little line across her neck like that? Can you see that? Well, um, interesting thing happened to St. Winifred. <laughs> Um, in A.D. 660, she refused the advances of some nasty rich lord because of her chaste nature. And he got angry at her and lopped her head off. And where it fell to the ground, a well sprung from there. 
And then fortunately, she had a saint for an uncle who must have been good at crocheting because he put her head back on, knitted it around the outside, and she miraculously came to life. And you can go visit that well right now, and it's supposed to be a healing well right here. And, um, and so we were there hanging around, and I thought, hmm, shall I dip my hand into this healing well, even though I know this is just a wonderful myth? Do you suppose I did? Yeah, I did. <laughs> you know you got to cover all your bases and stuff. Um, all across this island of Anglesey, there are these Celtic crosses. They were built for two reasons. One, to commemorate the dead, and two, uh, a lot of times the monks would go from monastery to monastery over treacherous bog land and they wanted to use these as a guidepost. This one is interesting because it has the Christian symbols in a Celtic cross and also Viking symbols down to the bottom. So you have three different sort of, of overwhelming social influences uh, on one um, uh, Celtic cross and uh, also look more standing stones I guess I've <laughs> you can't have too many pictures of, of stone circles but the, the reason I show these is that when you go to England uh, when when you go to England I want you to go there and visit more than one uh, stone circle will you do that okay really oh good oh very good <clears throat> um, also this is one of those burial chambers that, that take a look at this this is a six thousand year old burial chamber and the people who built this had ropes they had stone tools they might have had logs those are big stones and they figure that when the when the person they did find some remains here and when they the person was put in there the soil level was up to the top and it sort of protected the grave it has eroded away now way off in a meadow and um, the sheep appreciate its, its cover during uh, bad weather and sunny days and stuff like that. And you can walk right up to it and put your hands on it and wonder who it was that was buried there. Um, also, uh, one of the f other fascinating islands of the British Isles is represented by this. And uh, have any of you been to the Isle of Man? Oh, yeah. oh that's right, you were there on it by accident. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> it's a fascinating place. It, here it is, look, right there. And you can go there and, and uh, there's, uh, I, actually I took this picture on the, on the ferry that we took there from Dublin, Isle of Man Steam Packet Company. That's, they still have a ferry there. It's called Steam Packet because early on they used steam, uh, steam powered boats to, to take you there. Um, but, uh, the most important aspect of this is it's Victorian times. Queen Elizabeth and everybody who was notable and, and rich and sociable in England wanted to go here and to be seen and to see. And the best place to do that was a promenade. This was just a wide sidewalk that was all the way across the front and, and you would dress up in your finest. And, uh, and you can imagine Great Gadsby or, or um, uh, Oscar Wilde or, um, Bertie Wooster, yes, Bertie Wooster walking along there. <laughs> yeah, and um, this actually is a poster that was in one of those. These are Victorian hotels. We stayed in one of those Victorian hotels, and I did feel like Oscar Wilde for a couple of days, but it goes away. Um, and um, also, if you walk along there, even now, brass bands and Wurlitzers still give this Victorian promenade a festive sort of Victorian atmosphere. And you know, we, we just happened to upon, upon those. And how many of you, um, remember how Monty Python starts out? Uh, what we heard that brass pan band playing was that tune as we walked up there and I thought, mm, it's come full circle. Um, they also have preserved their Victorian transportation. There's an electric railroad. We rode in this car called, uh, hauled by a, uh, uh, a horse. Also, one of the things that I don't enjoy there, but they have the thing called TT races. And they are crazy. People come there from all over the world with the fastest motorcycles possible. And they are little bitty lanes with sharp corners that have, have stone walls at the end of them. And they go oh, speeds in excess of 100 miles an hour. And it's for three weeks during the summer. And during those three weeks, I guess, is all you hear is this, you know. And uh, so I, we didn't go there in that week. But, uh, and each year, three or four people are killed. 
uh, in these races because it is really dangerous. And every year they think, oh, we should do something about that. And they don't. <laughs> and they race again, but they are nuts. They also preserve their Victorian history as well. Uh, this is called the Lexi wheel, and it pumped huge wheel, and it pumped water out of an of a iron mine that was uh, up on the north part of the island. The Isle of Man, however, has this rich 6,000-year history, and you can see it in, in everything. But we found the most fascinating part. Are this the people? Just an amazing, welcoming, happy group of folks. Uh, on uh, your left is a group of people who, there are things called fancy dress parties, and you just dress up wacky and go and, and uh, apparently drink a lot and celebrate, I guess. And uh, we ran into them. <laughs> from one place to another. <laughs> and, uh, and so, and also take a look, you see that there's my wife on uh, the left and a friend of ours on the right, but between her was a wonderful man that we ran into and he was a pilot in the RAF during the Second World War. He's 92 when we took that picture and he had amazing stories to tell. Because as you probably realize, you know, we lost a lot of people in the Second World War. Brenda and I visited one of the American cemeteries there, and it is sobering to see the rows of white tombstones. But England was much more intimately associated with the Second World War. They were bombed. They uh, were in fear of uh, invasion. And in fact, part of England was invaded and occupied uh, by the Nazis during the Second World War. And um, that was uh, the island of Guernsey. And take a look at this now. Here is England. This is Cornwall down in here. There's London. This is France here. That is the island of Guernsey. And it is part of the British Isles. And uh, the touching thing about this is Guernsey was the only part of the British Isles to be occupied by the Nazis during the Second World War. I went to a German occupation museum that they have on there, and these are some drawings, hand drawings, that were made by the inhabitants of the island of Guernsey who uh, were put into um, concentration camps by the Nazis. And it was a hard time for there. In fact, what happened was, is they thought the Nazis would be coming. They thought, you know, this looks bad. And a lot of the islanders, or maybe half of them or so, were evacuated to the mainland of, of uh, England. But some continued to, to stay there. And um, <clears throat> we visited this German occupation museum. And this fort out there has a uh, gun emplacement made out of concrete put there by the Nazis. And it had a huge gun at the time. And if they were thinking that if England was going to try to come back and invade, they were going to blow them out of the water. And these two ladies here told about what it was like. And one of the interesting things they said was that when the evacuees came back to Guernsey after its liberation, they were different. They were very different people. And it was like there was two different communities there because the people in the occupied area had lived a very different and hard and, and uh, but still solidifying life. And, um, it's, a, it's a, an amazing story to, to understand. There's a piece of literature that commemorates that. Brenda read this book, and, and she finds it to be an amazing book. It's called The Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Society. Have any of you heard of that book before? Yeah. Um, and what it talks about is the time that the Nazis were in, in the island of Guernsey. And it's called the Literary Society because the Nazis would only allow people to gather together if it was for literary purposes. And it was called the Potato Peel Pie Society because during the occupation they were so short of food that they ate everything they could. And they made pies of, of potato peels. It was a really hard time. But speaking of um, uh, literary heroes, our friend Victor Hugo uh, lived here. He finished Les Mis uh, while he was living in Guernsey. He wrote another really famous uh, uh, novel called, uh, anybody, how, can anybody pronounce that better than I can? I'm sure she said that perfectly, didn't she? Yes. <laughs> yes, Les Mis. Um, anyway, he lived here from 1856 and 1870, and here is a picture of Victor Hugo. And you know what? 
I'll be honest with you guys. I must admit one of my deep flaws here. I know one of those guys is Victor Hugo. I have no idea which one of those guys is. Do any of you know which one of those guys? How many of you are so familiar with Victor Hugo you can say, oh, it's a guy on the... You know? The guy on the right? Who? Fell on the right. That guy. Very good. Extra points for you. You can have one of the shots of whiskey when this is over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a well done thing. Um, but the deal about Guernsey, I mean, it has an amazing past, but its most appealing feature is its beautiful coastlines and dramatic seascapes. Almost all of these islands, all of the islands, and most of England have footpaths that are public footpaths that go right along the shore. And you can see the most beautiful country as you walk along there. And not only the island of Guernsey, but these ones that I've talked about before, uh, like Mull and, and uh, Orkneys and, and Shetlands, all of them, it is that coastline that makes these beautiful. And uh, when you go to England, don't ignore these, these mystical, mythical islands of, of England. Be sure and enjoy them and hire a car, crash it a couple of times, and get a holiday flat and have a wonderful time. Thank you very much. <clears throat>